Hi, my name is Fred Zelt. I'm a geologist living in Pittsburgh, and this is a recording of a talk that was given yesterday, January 21st, 2023, at a Caring for the Woods workshop held at Theo College in Greenville, Pennsylvania, Northwestern Pennsylvania. The workshop was sponsored by the Pennsylvania Department of Conservation and Natural Resources uh, and the Bureau of Forestry. Most of the workshop focused on forestry. This is a talk about geology and landscapes. Um, and I was really pleased to be able to participate. So let me get a uh, slide set going and we'll share the presentation from yesterday. Okay, um, so it was the Caring for the Woods workshop at Thiel um, and the talk is Special Geologic Features of Mercer and Crawford Counties. Let me get rid of the little talking head up in the corner. Okay. There we go. So um, some of the uh, material I'll talk about, um, you'll be able to find more detail about this if you look in the guidebooks for the Field Conference of Pennsylvania Geologists. There was just a conference held in Northwestern Pennsylvania focusing on glacial geology last year in October, 2022. And I'm especially grateful to two of the leaders, Gary Flieger and Eric Straffen for teaching me about glacial deposits in Northwestern PA. So uh, these guidebooks are all available free online, although the one for, from last year isn't uh, loaded quite yet. But if you go to the Field Conference of Pennsylvania Geologists uh, website, fcopg.org, you'll find uh, field trips for past guidebooks. And there have been other um, field trips focusing on glacial geology in Northwestern Pennsylvania in past years. So that's a, a resource for you if you'd like to uh, take a deeper dive into the technical aspects of the geology of the area. A little bit of background about me. Um, I grew up in Bethel Park, um, geologist, degrees from MIT and Princeton. I worked for Exxon, then Exxon Mobil for 30 years, retired in 2015. Um, been married to another Bethel Parker uh, since 1982. We have four kids, five grandkids. Um, we've lived uh, several different places, um, retired and went back to Pittsburgh in 2015. We live on Mount Washington. Uh, in retirement, I've become a certified league cycling instructor. I like to do uh, charity bike rides. And also I like to speak with groups large and small about energy, climate, and Pennsylvania geology. Um, climate seems to be the most popular topic these days. Um, a year or so ago, I founded Earth Science Excursions. I've been combining uh, my love for geology with hiking and cycling uh, with the public. And I've done lots of excursions that combine those in Western Pennsylvania. Also, uh, a couple of years ago during the pandemic, I created a, a cycling science, a STEM and cycling curriculum for kids, and I've used it to teach more than 150 kids so far. So uh, combining those uh, uh, excursions and geology, last year as a volunteer with Pittsburgh nonprofit Venture Outdoors, I led an excursion on each of the 25 bike trails longer than 10 miles in Western Pennsylvania. And you can see those on the map. Um, they're in the white bubbles, they're numbered. Uh, we called it a 22 and 22 uh, theme. Uh, then I realized there were three more up in the Pennsylvania wilds that technically are in Western Pennsylvania. So we had a wilds weekend, 25 rides in all. Um, and there were geology and history themes to the rides, but to supplement um, the uh, excursion participants experiences, I uh, lumped them into themes of areas. So six different uh, types of terrain, uh, six different geologic areas, and recorded a YouTube video like this one um, to go along with those excursions. Um, and I've, I've posted those on YouTube, so they're all publicly available. Um, and I'll refer to some of these uh, because they have a lot more detail about some of the things that I'll talk about or just refer to. I really want this talk to focus on Northwestern Pennsylvania, Mercer and Crawford counties. So some of the background, I'll just say, and if you'd like more background about climate, uh, look at the glacial edition, 22 and 22 talk. To find these, if you go on YouTube, if you just search my unusual name, Fred Zelt on YouTube, you'll find them. 
or if you search something like 22 and 22 geology, you can find them that way too. Another one I'll highlight on this slide is the one in the blue outline, the Allegheny and Upper Ohio River Valleys talk. Um, some of the things we'll talk about are, are explained in a lot more detail in, in that talk too. So there's six of these. Um, there's about six hours content in total, including a seventh uh, briefer uh, talk that's kind of an introduction to the other six. So this is another resource available for you to learn more. Um, look at the re uh, uh, resources in there, the references cited in there, and dig a little bit deeper if you choose. Okay, the objectives of this presentation are to increase your awareness of how the landscape around Mercer Crawford County has been shaped and relate that to uh, things relevant to the forest oriented workshop, um, soil type and drainage. Um, I'd like people to be aware of the different rock types that are common and can be found in the area. And we'll spend most of the talk looking at some of the really neat features landscapes of the region and how those were formed. So you can see the agenda, we'll start out with big picture of landscapes, talk, then talk about glaciations, and then get into the details of specific areas, some of the really neat uh, special features of Mercer and Crawford County area. Um, during the workshop, I had three tables covered with rocks, <laughs> many of them found uh, in the area, all of them from the region uh, to help people identify uh, different types of rocks. Um, that can be found there. And this slideshow has a few pictures of rocks. So there are some pictures here too. Here we go into the landscapes now. This is uh, um, an elevation map centered on Western Pennsylvania. You can see the black outline of the state. Red is high, green is low. You can see a, a scale in feet um, on the lower right. And um, the landscape in most of Pennsylvania here is really a strongly erosional landscape. These long ridges are held up by sandstones resistant to erosion, sandstone layers. There are layers of shale and limestone in the valleys less resistant to erosion. Here's Pittsburgh. Uh, the rocks at the bedrock at the surface in Pittsburgh was once buried something like 8,000 feet below other uh, layers of rock that have all been worn away. Um, even more overburden uh, farther east in Pennsylvania. Thousands and thousands of feet of rock have been eroded away since these rocks were deposited. The bedrock here is hundreds of millions of years old. So it's a strongly erosional landscape. And the pattern here, uh, which is described in a lot more detail in the Laurel Highlands 22 and 22 talk, um, the pattern here relates to a fold belt that was created during a continental scale collision 300 million years ago that raised a mountain chain at least as high as the Andes, now worn down to its roots, as I mentioned. Um, so these rock layers are intensely folded uh, layers. You might picture pushing a carpet on a hardwood floor up against a wall. If it buckled, 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 uh, made folds. And then if you cut those folds off, uh, wore those folds down to their roots, you might get this kind of a pattern with more resistant rock layers forming the ridges here in the Appalachians. There are broader folds in this high area. This is the Laurel Highlands. That's Chestnut Ridge, Laurel Hill. These broad folds are held up by sandstones resistant to erosion. Um, so that's where there are high elements in this erosional landscape. Here is a plateau. So the area we'll talk about in Northwestern Pennsylvania is part of the plateau where the sedimentary rock layers are relatively flat lying. There still, still are some folds and other uh, geologic structures, but they're much smaller, lower in relief than the ones here in the Laurel Highlands and much, much smaller than the ones farther east in the Appalachians. So we are in the plateau. The rivers here go kind of every which direction, not a strong preferred orientation like in the uh, province here in the Appalachians. Um, Look at the landscapes here in Ohio, a lot smoother landscapes in Northern Ohio, Northwestern Pennsylvania. The uh, previous bedrock river valleys here, uh, the highs have been smoothed out by glaciers eroding, uh, but also the valleys have had uh, glacial age sediment, uh, partially at least fill them in. So it's a much more 
low relief, even landscape. And you can, you can even use this map to pick the boundary between this smooth glacial landscape and this strongly erosional landscape. So the area where we'll focus is really close to that boundary between the strongly erosional landscape off to the east and the smoother glacial landscape farther to the west. In the next slide, we'll take a closer look at this area. So here's a, a map again, centered on Northwestern Pennsylvania. You can see Interstate 79, Interstate 80, 90 are labeled here. Um, if you look really closely, you might be able to see the boundary of Mercer County. Um, there's Mercer, the boundary of Crawford County here. Um, there's uh, Meadville and uh, um, Erie County to the north. So look at the elevations. Again, red is high, green is low. You can see these stream valleys with steep sides, hundreds of feet deep. And then you transition into this area with a lot broader, lower relief landforms. There still are valleys, but they're not as deep and they don't have as uh, sharp edges as these, this strongly erosional landscape. So we're right in that um, transition area. Look at the shapes of the streams here. Um, here in Forest County, um, this is uh, uh, Tyanesta Creek. And you see how the tributaries point downstream. That's very normal. This is the Clarion River. Same thing. The tributaries point downstream toward the Allegheny River, the way the river, uh, Clarion River flows. This area has never been glaciated. And uh, that's uh, typical for streams and rivers. Compare that with the arrangement of uh, uh, stream valleys here. They make all kinds of crazy shapes, ovals and circles, uh, because glaciers have come and gone, come and gone here. Um, there's been reversal of drainage where uh, streams that once drained to the north, then were forced to drain to the south. Um, there's some good examples of that here. Um, Titusville is, is right here. This is uh, Oil Creek uh, flowing today down to the Allegheny River. But you can see from the arrangement of tributaries and the way that the valley uh, generally gets wider uh, previously downstream to the north, that uh, this uh, valley, Oil Creek Valley, uh, coming out of Titusville is interpreted to have previously flowed to the north. And there are other river valleys like that. Uh, for example, uh, the current Allegheny River Valley here north of Warren. When glaciers came, they stopped that northern flow of, of rivers um, and uh, dammed them up, created uh, lakes temporarily. And then those lakes spilled over highland areas, drainage divides, and then uh, enabled those uh, streams and rivers to be able to flow to the south. So this is Oil Creek State Park. It's especially scenic because it's a former drainage divide that's been cut through um, uh, during glacial times. It's a nice, young, steep little valley, very scenic. There are other places like that too. Uh, there's, there's one uh, here um, on, on this side of Warren as well. And Oil Creek, which uh, the valley used to flow to the north, now has drainage reversal flows south um, through Oil Creek State Park and Oil City down to the Allegheny River. So those kinds of drainage reversals are common in the Mercer Crawford County area as well. Um, and they're pretty common all along uh, areas in front of glaciers. This is a geologic map um, centered on uh, northwestern Pennsylvania. And the colors this time relate to the ages of sedimentary rock layers that are at the surface. So here in south uh, central, uh, central western Pennsylvania, there are rocks of Pennsylvanian age in these green colors at the surface. Um, the, the lavender here are Mississippian, a little bit older age rocks. And then the Devonian rocks uh, at the surface are in brown. And those rock layers have typical different uh, rock types in them. The basal part, the lower part of the Pennsylvanian here, uh, there are a lot of hard sandstones. Those sandstones that held up Chestnut Ridge and Laurel Hill, uh, the sandstones that help hold up uh, the Allegheny Front as a high, those are in this um, kind of greenish color. And that's a big part of what makes the Pennsylvania wilds, uh, the wilds. Um, an erosional landscape with steep valleys, 
uh, but a rocky area too with those Pennsylvania uh, rocks uh, hosting soils that are thin, rocky. Um, they don't have great buffering capability. So uh, soils with uh, decaying plant material tend to be acidic. A lot, most plants don't really love acidic soils. Um, so not having buffering capability is not super great for uh, cropland agriculture. And there's not a whole lot of that in the Pennsylvania wilds. That's why it's the wilds. And you can see that the same age of rocks are here in uh, Mercer and Southern Crawford County, but they have a veneer of glacial sediment on top. So the soils that are developed here aren't the same as the soils developed on these bedrocks because these have uh, glacial sediments on top that include sediment that's been carried um, into the area from tens, even hundreds of miles to the north and has some buffering capability because some of the area that was eroded and uh, developed into sediment that the glaciers carried, some of that has limestone in it, has calcium carbonate that has buffering capabilities. You've probably noticed it by now, but the blue line here is the uh, limit of glaciation, glaciers having come to the north. So this is the area that's purely an erosional landscape uh, versus a landscape that's been modified quite a bit by glaciers. And that'll be the focus of much of the talk here. This is a generalized cross section across Pennsylvania from uh, west on the left to east on the right. And this time uh, we're looking at uh, age of rocks from old at the bottom to younger. These are all hundreds of millions of years old though. Um, and the colors on this reflect the type of rock. The yellows are sandstones. Many of those are quartz rich. These are those quartz rich sandstones that um, hold up many of the ridges and the Appalachians that I pointed out in the map before. Um, this is uh, Pottsville is that resistant sandstone that holds up Chestnut Ridge, Laurel Hill. Um, helps make the Pennsylvania wilds wild. Um, there are some other sandstones and shales interbedded in the Mississippian age rocks here in Mercer and Crawford counties. But the upper Devonian rocks, the late Devonian rocks in that area are largely offshore shales shown in white on this um, schematic cross section. Um, another rock type I'd like to point out, um, the blues indicate carbonates limestones are in the medium blues. And one of the limestones I'll talk about is the Vanport limestone here of Pennsylvanian age. It's a marine limestone formed when a seaway brought salt water into Western Pennsylvania. But here in the middle Devonian, um, uh, the lower part of the Devonian rocks and older rocks, you can see that there are other limestones. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, those rock layers where they're in, where they crop out to the north um, rocks from those layers have been picked up by glaciers, carried into northwestern Pennsylvania, and help give the soils there a better buffering capability than they might have otherwise. Okay, now let's talk about glaciations. I'm only going to show one climate chart. Um, if you look at the Glacial Edition 22 and 22 um, YouTube talk, there's a whole section about paleoclimate. So I'll explain in a lot more detail the basis for this chart of global climate, uh, warm and cold periods, glacial and interglacial periods. It's uh, much more thoroughly explained there, but I'll, I'll just say that this chart is based on marine microfossils and it uses stable oxygen isotopes as a proxy of uh, temperature, as a proxy for global climate. And the scale here, uh, the lateral scale is in thousands of years with uh, today on the left, and I've highlighted 100,000 year increments. This goes back uh, more than a million years. Um, this climate uh, record uh, preserved in marine fossils goes back actually hundreds of millions of years. And also for the last million years, there's a similar oxygen isotope climate record from ice cores from Greenland and Antarctica. Um, so we have great confidence, especially in the uh, last million years or so of this climate record you can see this labeled with all these names. Um, geologists use these uh, uh, names of uh, periods here to uh, communicate with each other about uh, sedimentary deposits from different parts of the world. So these are different glacial stages. 
We're in a, an interglacial period now. It's been around for about the last 12,000 years. There still are glaciers in Antarctica and Greenland, but um, there aren't glaciers all through Canada down into Pennsylvania um, like there were during the last glacial maximum, which was about 18 or 20,000 years ago. So here's a previous interglacial period. You can see other glacial periods and interglacial periods that alternate. The last glacial maximum before the most recent one, the previous one was about 140,000 years ago. We'll talk about that one a little bit. But you can see that these major glacial and interglacial periods have alternated about every 100,000 years uh, for the last million years with a higher frequency cyclicity superimposed on that. And uh, these cycles are thought to reflect global uh, cycles of Earth's orbit around the sun uh, that affected global climate. Those cycles have been happening all through Earth history. There are records of them in sedimentary rocks all through Earth history. Um, and so they're very natural cycles. And those are also explained in the glacial talk. I'll show this chart again and relate the landscapes in Northwestern Pennsylvania to these glacial periods shown in this uh, climate chart. Here's someone's interpretation of thickness of glaciers uh, during the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago. And uh, the scale here is in meters. So these glaciers uh, at their thickest were kilometers, thousands of meters thick. Um, the glaciers around the shoreline of Lake Erie might have been something like 3,000 feet thick thousands of feet thick down into northwestern Pennsylvania, certainly thick enough to have dammed and, and blocked up rivers that used to flow to the north. So you'd have snow falling in Canada. Um, when it uh, compacts, it turns to ice, the ice slowly uh, flowing uh, toward the edges of the ice here, the snout of the glacier, and then melting there. And as the ice flowed, uh, picking up, uh, eroding into bedrock, picking up pieces of rock from underneath and dragging those along on the bottom of the glacier or within the glacial ice. And then they are dropped out at the edge of the ice uh, where it melts. So pretty thick ice and pretty extensive during the last maximum glaciation. This uh, shows different areas of glaciation versus non-glaciation. Here in this part of Canada, the bedrock at the surface, which has been scoured by glaciers, not only in this last glaciation, which uh, by the way, started about 2.6 million years ago, not just a million years ago, but longer than that. Um, so it was scoured not only by that glaciation, but there have been previous earth glaciations, not only in the last hundreds of millions of years, but there have been other glaciations billions of years ago. Um, so this has seen multiple periods of glaciation. It's gotten it down to bedrock um, that as, as we'll talk about, um, uh, north of our area, up, up here in Ontario, rocks that would have been buried previously, probably at least as deep as 30,000 feet, but now uh, uh, are at daylight because of uh, all this erosion. So area of scouring and erosion by glaciers. This is an area where there's uh, sedimentary rock cover preserved, rocks that are hundreds of millions of years old, but not scoured down to rocks that are billions of years old and were super deeply buried. Uh, like in this northern area. And there are glacial deposits preserved here, both both bedrock and glacial deposits. This is an area in Pennsylvania where there's bedrock at the surface, never glaciated. We talked about that strongly erosional landscape. Um, I'll mention that uh, uh, we talked about reorientation of rivers. The Allegheny River was forced to uh, run in front of the glaciated area when glaciers came. And the same thing with the Ohio River here, which forms the southern boundary of the state of Ohio, Indiana, um, down here through uh, Illinois too. So there was once a river uh, before glacial times with its headwaters in the Blue Ridge in North Carolina that flowed across the grain of the Appalachians, the New River, um, the Kanawha, and actually flowed across the middle of Ohio here, not far from Columbus, Indiana, and Illinois, um, and then when glaciers came, it buried that 400 foot deep bedrock valley, completely overran it and buried it, uh, filled it with glacial deposits. So it's all just pretty smooth and flat at the surface. Now you can't even see it. And it forced the Ohio River to flow farther south than this major drainage had been flowing 
previously. And there's a, a more detail about that in the Rivers talk, the um, Upper Ohio and Allegheny River Valleys talk in the 22 and 22 series, if you'd like to learn more about that. Here's a, a map of uh, glacial deposits in Ohio. There were several participants in the workshop at Deal uh, from Ohio, uh, but uh, that's not the only reason I like to show this map. It's just a great map, and it will be able to uh, see together really well expressed some of the features that will be important to us in understanding northwestern Pennsylvania a little bit later on. So the glacial sediments uh, are colored here uh, by uh, age, and down here near Cincinnati, uh, the glacial deposits here are the older ages of glaciations, not the last glacial period, but periods before that. So these older glacial deposits kind of peak out in front of uh, the deposits in green shades here are from the most recent glaciation, that gl last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago. So in front of that, there still are some glacial deposits preserved from previous glaciations. Um, successive glaciations tend to wipe out uh, the previous glacial deposits and kind of incorporate them. Um, so uh, that's a common thing where you won't find evidence of previous glaciations, although they, uh, they did happen. Um, in the last glacial uh, deposits, uh, last glaciation deposits, these medium green bands are moraines. That's, those are places where the snout of the glacier, the end of the glacier paused here for a while, the conveyor belt of sediment that is a glacier kept bringing sediment down where it melted, where the ice melted at the snout that deposited that sediment. So these are low hills uh, with glacial de debris where the end of the glacier paused for a while. So the glacier would have uh, paused, retreated, paused, retreated, paused, retreated. You can see this stepwise retreat um, up through this part of Ohio. And also notice from the pattern of these moraines that clearly there was a lobe of a glacier here, another lobe of a glacier here. You can see there was a, a lobe of a glacier here in northeastern Ohio as well. Um, the blue colors here are glacial age lake deposits. So before there was Lake Erie, this is the shoreline of Lake Erie, before Lake Erie, kind of predecessor lakes um, at higher levels here uh, deposited uh, fine grain sediment, lake sediment, uh, of glacial age when actually the snout of the glacier was uh, farther north and to the east, but still there was a, a lake here of glacial age. And we'll look at some of those uh, glacial age lake deposits um, along the Erie shoreline in Northwestern Pennsylvania. You'll notice that there's some blue in uh, river and stream valleys here too. And remember I mentioned that there were streams that used to flow to the north when glaciers came they dammed those streams and rivers. There would have been glacial lake deposits um, uh, laid down in those. Um, and that's, that's uh, what's shown in blue down here in this otherwise unglaciated area. OK, so northeastern Ohio, you can see um, evidence of an older glaciation and then some younger glacial deposits. Uh, these yellow are water wash deposits of glacial age. And you'll see the same sort of thing as we uh, move into Pennsylvania. So here's the same kind of map for Pennsylvania. And you can see in uh, north, uh, what, western Pennsylvania, the green and brown here are older glaciations. The blue shades are from the youngest, most recent glaciation. Uh, various ages of glacial deposits from older here to younger. Uh, and then the yellow are water washed uh, sediments of glacial age some of those water wash sediments having gone, gone out into the area that wasn't glaciated like we saw in the map in Ohio too. Um, Northeastern Pennsylvania was um, glaciated as well. You can see the same type of color scheme in that area too. And the dashed line here is actually um, the uh, estimated edge of any glaciation uh, coming into Pennsylvania. Um, there aren't as uh, continuous deposits of uh, glacial age here, but there may be boulders, cobbles uh, here of material that was clearly carried by glaciers from somewhere 
much farther north um, doesn't really belong in this area, but it was carried in by glaciers. So some of the older glaciations uh, probably came farther into Pennsylvania than the areas of the solid colors on this map. And we're gonna look at, at this area and uh, uh, surface geologic map of glacial deposits in a lot more detail. Here's, here's the map. We're gonna repeat this map a few times. I've outlined Mercer and Crawford counties here for reference. And on this map of glacial deposits in Northwestern Pennsylvania, you can see the older tills are in these uh, bluish gray shades. And then this, the, the uh, glacial deposits from the youngest glaciation are in these colors that start with pink shades here, turn into other colors. So the very youngest uh, glacial deposits in the state, uh, Northwestern Pennsylvania are exposed on the Erie Lake shore. And I'll show you some pictures of those. Um, we'll look at this map in some detail to understand what these colors reflect and what they mean in terms of soils and, and uh, shapes of landforms. But for now, uh, let's compare this to the climate chart we, chart we showed earlier. So um, there's been age dating of uh, glacial deposits in this area, as well as in Ohio. And uh, we're confident that uh, these glacial deposits are from this most recent glaciation, again, with the glacial maximum about 18 or 20,000 years ago. Uh, these tills, these glacial deposits uh, have been age dated also and are thought to reflect the glaciation from about 140,000 years ago or so. There have been uh, some uh, estimates for ages of uh, these glacial deposits. Um, they're older uh, and exactly how much older uh, is not confidently known. Um, there's been an estimate that uh, they may reflect uh, these glaciations, but uh, there's more work to do there uh, to age date those. Some people have thought that uh, they, they could reflect uh, deposits as old as 700,000 years. So certainly hundreds of thousands of years old for these older glacial deposits versus uh, tens of thousands of years old. Remember that maximum was 20,000 years ago for the younger glacial deposits. Let's talk about rock types a little bit. This will help us understand some of the maps that we'll see. Um, three main types of rocks. Sedimentary rocks are laid down uh, grain by grain, uh, sand, silt, clay, pebbles, cobbles, boulders, where those are uh, deposited by rivers um, in floodplains adjacent to rivers, deposited in deltas, on beaches, offshore uh, muds, or um, where a seaway might flood into an area um, with uh, salt water. You might have uh, uh, lots of calcium carbonate uh, created by uh, things living in the salt water and have a limestone uh, calcium carbonate deposit. Um, so those are all sedimentary deposits. Here you can see uh, some little pebbles in a conglomerate. Those are rounded by transport. This was probably deposited in a river. Um, and uh, here's a rock that has lots of uh, fossil shells in it. Um, and uh, so a couple of examples of sedimentary rocks, which can include limestones as well as sandstones and shales that are full of clay. Metamorphic rocks um, have, can be buried. Uh, ro sedimentary rocks or igneous rocks that are buried so deeply that they recrystallize, turn into metamorphic rocks. So they're crystalline rocks. They have tightly interlocking angular crystals, not rounded grains like these sedimentary grains that have been transported, but interlocking uh, grains and uh, deeply buried metamorphic rocks that have recrystallized are actually so deeply buried that the rock is plastic. It, it deforms in a plastic way and flows. So having Banded rocks, uh, uh, that's, uh, that's one type of, uh, 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 type of uh, metamorphic rock. Um, also marbles, uh, if you metamorphose uh, limestone, uh, it can completely recrystallize and then turn into a marble. They can be white, they can be banded, they can be pink, gray, different colors. But marbles are another example of a metamorphic rock. Igneous rocks are formed from liquid rock. And where liquid rock or magma is down deep in the earth and it cools slowly and the crystals form slowly, get to grow large enough to see, then you might get something like a granite. With these 
interlocking uh, different types of minerals, um, interlocking grains, angular grains. If the magma comes to the surface um, and it's cooled quickly, if it comes to the surface as lava and is cooled quickly, the crystals might be too small to see with the eye, uh, or it might be just glass with uh, really not a crystal structure. And those are um, volcanic rocks. Um, so those are all types of igneous rocks. And now uh, we'll use those in uh, looking at some of the area. So here's a geologic map for a much bigger area. You can see the outline of Pennsylvania in gray. The star here is Northwestern Pennsylvania, the dashed white line, maximum glacial advance. And these broad colors um, are uh, sedimentary rock layers. We talked about Carboniferous, Devonian rock layers. Um, the Carboniferous includes the, the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian uh, ages that I talked about before. Those are the Carboniferous. Um, there's Devonian. Uh, remember, it's uh, largely shale in uh, northwestern Pennsylvania and to the north. And then there's some older rock layers. Remember, in the cross section, we saw that there are some limestones in the Middle Devonian, also in the Silurian, also in the Ordovician, and glaciers uh, would have carried uh, some of those uh, sediments, uh, those carbonate sediments into northwestern Pennsylvania to give a little bit of buffering capability to the soils derived from those glacial sediments. Look at the big change in pattern here. So to the north here, those are much older rocks. These uh, GA refers to billions of years. Here in the Adirondacks, uh, the, the metamorphic and igneous rocks, they're about a billion years old, more than a billion years old here. These black lines are faults uh, where rock bodies have moved one relative to another. Um, there are rock different rock bodies across those. And across this fault are much older Precambrian rocks, older than 2 billion years. Um, and uh, igneous and metamorphic rocks so glaciers picked up igneous and metamorphic rocks in this part of Canada and carried it down into northwestern Pennsylvania. So those kinds of rocks aren't uh, naturally occurring in bedrock in Pennsylvania. When you see those in the glacial deposits, igneous and metamorphic rocks, you know that they could have come from no closer than here in Ontario and may have come from much farther away than that. In the um, glacial 22 and 22 talk, um, there's also a discussion of why the Great Lakes are shaped as they are, how they formed, how glaciers formed them. Um, so there's more detail about the Great Lakes there. Now let's look at some of the special features of Northwestern Pennsylvania. This is a map of ecoregions, and you can see that uh, the, green, the blue here is a mixed woods plains. Um, this area, the strongly erosional landscape, bedrock at the surface, uh, making soils um, is in a different, a couple of different ecoregions. This is a really special area um, because some of the landscape here is left over by glaciers um, as not an erosional landscape. Um, there are natural lakes, natural bogs, swampy areas, and some uh, really different ecosystems than much of the rest of the state. Um, the other glaciated part of the state is more similar in terms of uh, Eco regions. So I mentioned natural lakes. This map shows the eight natural lakes in northwestern Pennsylvania, the three county area. They're shown with the blue outlines and also have the names here. Um, the uh, impoundments or reservoirs that are formed by dams are shown with these kind of sketchy outlines. So there are eight uh, natural glacial lakes here. Some of them have been enhanced by a dam that's been added to deepen the lake and broaden the lake, but they are uh, natural lakes that have been there for thousands of years. And they're special places because the ecosystems there have existed and been uh, evolving uh, for thousands of years too. So those are very special uh, parts of uh, this glaciated area in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And natural lakes like this just aren't found in that strongly erosional landscape in uh, uh, much of the rest of Pennsylvania. Um, you can imagine that rainwater there where it falls on a hillside runs into a stream, into a river, and eventually ends up in the Gulf of Mexico or um, Atlantic Ocean um, uh, versus drainages here that were lows 
in the landscape created by glaciers and there's no connection to a stream. So there are lots of natural lakes and ponds uh, here as well as bogs and swamps. Okay, now we're gonna look in more detail at several areas across the Mercer County, uh, Crawford County region. And we're gonna work our way from north to south. And remember the glacial sediments are less than 2.6 million years old that cover uh, much of this area, but the bedrock below is hundreds of millions of years old. And remember that the older tills are to the um, east and south here. The youngest till is up on the lake shore. Um, and you can see these stream valleys and you can see they have glacial sediments that are different than the glacial sediments in the upland areas. So here we go, we're gonna start with the Erie Lake shore, and then we'll look at the areas with the red boxes uh, working our way from north to south. So the Erie Lake shore, the features to highlight here, um, I'll show you the uh, youngest, freshest till that's exposed in those lake shore bluffs. And till is an unsorted glacial sediment. Till is a special word that refers to unsorted glacial sediment. When you say till, you know it's glacial. Um, and it often has a lot of clay in it, which means that soils based on tills really don't drain very well. And till itself, um, uh, water doesn't percolate through till very well. Um, in contrast, where a glacial till has been uh, exposed to water, waters run across it, um, it'll tend to wash away the clay, uh, separate it from the sand and, and gravel. And those water washed, sandy, gravelly glacial sediments um, have a lot better drainage and the soils based on them can have very good drainage. So different compositions and different drainages too. There's till in the lakeshore bluff here on the Erie shoreline. You can see that there are boulders in it. You'll see some closer views of till later. This is the Devonian bedrock in place. You can see the uh, bedrock layers. This is a stream coming out uh, that's kept this free of ice. Um, so you can see the layering in this gray shale, uh, Devonian bedrock, very clay rich. And uh, where the glacier eroded uh, similar Devonian bedrock out where the um, lake is now, uh, the glaciations would have scoured the depression that is the lake. Um, that's uh, much of what is in the till here. Uh, ground up bits of uh, Devonian shale, very clay rich till, and you can see it's gray in color. The till on the southern shore of Lake Ontario, in contrast, um, is largely made up of a, a red, older shale, and the till there is red in color. So uh, the former Devonian shale that was where the Lake Erie is now is kind of spread all over the landscape in glacial deposits to the south of the lake. The pebbles, cobbles, boulders in the till here uh, are eroded out onto the beach, um, the natural rate of retreat here of shoreline erosion is about one to three feet per year if there is no structure engineered to protect uh, the shoreline bluffs. So there's always a constant crop of glacial uh, carried uh, cobbles, boulders, uh, pebbles picked up from bedrock farther to the north, um, eroded out onto the beach here. Those uh, cobbles roll around, get polished and rounded and lots of people like to come here and collect rocks because there are lots of rocks here from uh, places hundreds of miles to the north, uh, rock types that aren't commonly found in bedrock, uh, that aren't found at all in bedrock in northwestern Pennsylvania. Here's another view of a lakeshore bluff with till. Here's a big limestone boulder that was uh, eroded out of the till carried by glaciers uh, left here. Um, this boulder has some pretty neat fossils in it, fossil sponges. It's also a little bit polished and striated on some of the edges. Um, so some pretty big clasts uh, are in this, uh, some pretty big uh, pieces of rock. Here's a close-up of till. Um, you can see it's not sorted at all. There's no layering to it. It hasn't been sorted by water. It's just been sitting under the glacier here um, under a lot of pressure and and kind of grinding uh, force uh, laterally. Um, so it's all a mixed up deposit, not sorted with uh, sand, clay, silt, all sizes of grains, as, uh, even as big as uh, this boulder, pebbles, cobbles, and boulders. 
Here's a really special uh, type of rock that came straight out of Till on the lake shore. This is a piece of limestone that was picked up by the glacier, carried along, and at times it was at the bottom of the uh, till uh, and rubbed against bedrock there and would have rubbed flat sides in it. So it's faceted. Um, it would have rolled over another flat side. So you can see here's a flat side. There's a different flat side here. There are other flat sides. There also are um, compression fractures on it. You can imagine the weight of, um, uh, if, if this got caught between two other rocks, kind of the weight and force that would have caused that kind of a fracture. And you can see the grooves here. So this might have been uh, uh, rubbing against bedrock and then the rock flipped a little bit and there were grooves in another orientation, another orientation. So it's a very special type of rock. It's not super common, but it is found in uh, glacial tills. And uh, I'm sure that, that there are rocks like this in tills in Erie and Mercer, uh, Mercer and Crawford counties as well, uh, but they're not really very common. And um, you don't see this type of uh, feature, fasting and striation on uh, granites. Those are some of the hardest rocks around. So those are rocks that are, that are grooving other rocks, uh, uh, scoring into them. You can see some crude fastening on those sometimes, but they're typically not polished because those are kind of the hardest rocks around. And rocks that are softer than limestone tend to get destroyed. So um, the fasted and grooved rocks that I found um, are typically made up of limestone. Pretty special rock that can be found in gl this glaciated area. Here's another uh, lakeshore bluff. This one's taller than the others because it has a beach perched on top of till. So there's gray till down here. Um, this picture actually comes from this uh, part of the lakeshore. Um, the till here, the gray till is covered by sand that's made its way down slope here as uh, this uh, lakeshore bluff has eroded. But above this black line, you can see how clearly layered the sediment here is. And it's sand. It's very fine grained sand. It's a beach deposit. It was water washed, sorted. The uh, clay was uh, carried away and deposited somewhere else. And there was a sandy deposit here perched on top of the till. There's a series of beach ridges of glacial age. Um, the till here is thought to be about 14,000 years old, uh, the last time glaciers sat on this part of Pennsylvania. But the beach ridge here obviously is younger, it's thought to be about 13,000 years old or maybe a couple hundred years younger than that. And again, it's one of a series of beach ridges. This is one of the younger ones. And where those beach ridges are on land, um, they form broad but long low ridges with sandy uh, sediment and it makes well-drained soils. So you'll see uh, concentrations of farms on those beach ridges. Um, there'll be vineyards, uh, orchards, uh, built, uh, growing ornamental plants and other crops on well-drained soils sitting on those beach ridges. Whereas the soils developed on top of this till, they don't drain poorly, water stands on them. Uh, or they do drain poorly water stands on them and uh, they're not as much used uh, for crop plants. Um, and so we don't have beach ridges in Mercer and Crawford County, but this, the concept applies there too. We'll see where there are water washed glacial sediments that are sandier and make really different soils than soils that are developed on top of this unsorted till. Okay, our next box is in the Edinburgh Waterford area. We're gonna focus on that, even though it's not in Mercer and Crawford counties, because there are just some really great examples of uh, glacial landscapes here. And the next slide, I'm gonna show a, a, a shaded LIDAR image. LIDAR is a uh, way to portray elevation of the ground surface. And it's uh, done with uh, laser measurements. If you've used a laser rangefinder, you've used very similar technology. It's like a laser rangefinder on steroids. Um, and you can find the LIDAR image that I'll show and others for Pennsylvania. Um, Penn State has a resource for finding those LIDAR images. If you'd like to look at your area or other parts of the state, um, that's publicly available. 
So here's a LIDAR image. Uh, there's Route 79 on the west here. There's Edinburgh, there's Waterford. Look at these hills. You see, see how they're elongate? These hills were shaped by glaciers that flowed from the north, northwest to the south-southeast. Really neat, long, glacially formed features. And see these sharp edge erosional stream valleys that are cutting into that previous glacial landscape. But they haven't made it into all of the landscape yet. Um, I really love being in a landscape like this where there are rolling glacial landforms, rolling hills that have been just the same for thousands of years, probably for 14,000 years or a little bit longer since glaciers left this area. Um, the, the landscape there hasn't been uh, eroded into yet and altered. So really neat uh, landscapes, rolling landscapes. You can see the same kind of features to the east of Waterford here. I'll point out this really different landscape, this flat valley here uh, with some bumps in it. And look at this higher area here. This is a moraine. It's a valley blocking moraine. Um, this is an outwash plain. And you'll see a lot more details of those um, in the next uh, set of slides. But I just wanted to point out this, this area near Waterford um, and how the valley is so different than this upland area, which preserves these really neat glacial landforms. Here's a 3D uh, Google Earth view of the area between Edinburgh and Waterford. And you can see these uh, long land landforms, uh, drumlins actually, um, uh, streamlined by glaciers. So it, this is a map showing uh, uh, in, uh, interpreted flow direction of the last glaciation. And you can see now why, what is the basis for that here in Northwestern Pennsylvania, those elongate landforms. And you get an idea of the basis for this uh, map in other areas. And you can see some of the bigger lobes of the glaciers here, uh, clearly flowing uh, generally from the north, northeast uh, from that area down into Northwestern Pennsylvania. Okay, now let's look at the area around Cory. And as I mentioned, we'll look at some uh, glacial deposits in a valley there. Here's the same kind of LIDAR image. Um, here's Cory, there's Union City, um, and there are smooth hills, upland areas here uh, with you know, recent streams cutting into them. But look at this flat uh, valley. So it's a flat outwash plain. There's a moraine going across it here, another one there. There's another one down, down there. I hope you can picture that this area was entirely overrun by glaciers, but then as the glacier retreated, um, there must have been a, a ton of ice that came down this valley, um, paused here for a while, built up a moraine, um, retreated, paused here for a while, built up a moraine near Cory, and there would have been sediment washing out of the moraine and, and uh, helping fill in the valley in this outwash plain. Uh, retreated again, formed another moraine here. So actually the, the surface of the, this relatively flat valley, it actually in elevation slopes down to the south here, down, down, down in this direction um, as the outwash uh, plain uh, sloped down and the outwash would have flowed down this direction. Uh, the present day stream direction actually can be different than that um, cutting into this. So there are examples of um, uh, drainage reversal in uh, outwash plains like this one. The red stars here indicate age dates uh, collected relatively recently in, and uh, um, reported in that uh, field conference of Pennsylvania geologists last year. Um, this is uh, 23.7 thousand years, give or take, 14.9 thousand years. This is a, a, um, an age that's taken in glacial deposits that are in, in a terrace on the edge of the outwash plain, outside the outwash plain, water washed glacial deposits, but that are on a terrace. So those deposits from 24,000 years ago during the last glaciation, the, the um, glacial tongue, the tongue of ice must have been going farther south at that time, whether it stopped here or stopped farther south, um, isn't, uh, it's, it's, that's an interpretation at this point, but um, the outwash deposit here is younger, 
So the glacier at this time must have been farther north, maybe here uh, and uh, um, uh, was laying down uh, glacial age sediment in the plain there. So there are some basis for the ages and details of ages in this area. This will help explain uh, some of the concepts there. So the upland area, the whole area would have been covered by glaciers, but then the main glacier retreated. The idea is a tongue of ice coming into this valley um, where the ice tongue paused for a while, built up a moraine at the end of it. Um, some of those moraines were valley blocking moraines um, in places, maybe an outwash meltwater stream could have cut through those. But one, this is one way to get a natural lake that could be blocked by a valley blocking moraine like this, swampy areas. If the retreating glacier leaves big chunks of ice behind on the outwash plain, and then sediment fills in around the ice, and then the ice melts, it can leave a kettle. And I'll I mentioned that because you hear people talk about kettle lakes. They can form lakes and ponds. Uh, they can be large or small. <clears throat> These are water wash deposits along the side of the glacier in a terrace. And you can see that there are some kind of uh, delta-like uh, water wash deposits. Um, and those can occur within the outwash plain as well. So uh, those are uh, another type of water wash deposit. Okay, let's look more closely at this valley blocking moraine near Cori. So here's the outwash plain. Um, you can see these uh, shapes are man-made uh, places where people have moved earth. Uh, you see examples here of that. But if you look through that, you can see these kind of curved shapes and generally this higher area near Cori where there's a moraine. Looking even more closely, I hope you can see these natural curve shapes. You can imagine the snout of the glacier having been here, moved back to here, moved back to here, just piles of sediment and a hummocky uh, kind of landscape on this uh, valley blocking moraine. So here's where we were just looking near Cori. This is the outwash plain. And this is uh, hummocky topography uh, on a terrace next to that outwash plain. And there's uh, Cori uh, that's dug into that. And we'll see that uh, Cori next. So here's what the water wash sediment looks like in that Cori, sand and gravel Cori. Um, you can see that there is some crude layering here, um, still pretty coarse grains here, but definitely a water wash deposit, not as rich in clay as the tills that we saw. Um, and the soils developed on this uh, would be uh, better drained than sil soils developed on a clay rich till. I'll point out that uh, this deposit has been age dated. It's been sitting there for 24,000 years. Um, so uh, the top of the land here would have had thousands of years of trees and plants growing, churning the soil uh, and the sediment below them with their roots. So you wouldn't expect to see this kind of layering near the surface. You'd have a soil horizon, an area that's been churned by roots. Uh, maybe there have been freeze-thaw cycles, some pretty profound freeze-thaw cycles here that helped uh, uh, move the soil, move the earth around where it's shallow. So typically the upper layer of sediment maybe as much as 10 or 20 feet of it would be all mixed up and uh, not uh, preserving uh, the uh, sedimentary layers from 24,000 years ago. That's a typical sort of thing in this area. These are some of the uh, pieces of rock in the glacial deposit here. Um, there's a, a banded metamorphic rock called NICE, G-N-E-I-S-S, -S, M for metamorphic. Here's a more, uh, even uh, evenly grained igneous rock, metamorphic rock with some large crystals in it. This is the sedimentary rock I showed earlier. This is the same kind of rock. This one, the uh, fossil shells haven't been dissolved away by groundwater and are still preserved as uh, calcium carbonate. And there are pieces of limestone in this too, as well as lots of pieces of sandstone. You get an idea that the uh, material in between these larger uh, pieces of rock, there's a lot of sand. Some more metamorphic rock, a pink granite, um, another metamorphic rock. And here's that uh, little pebbly conglomerate sedimentary rock that I showed previously. 
Okay, now let's look at uh, the area around the boundary between um, Crawford and Venango counties and uh, the area around Sugar Lake. And we're gonna look at some hummocky landscape of an end moraine. So on this map, oops, on this map, this uh, darker pink shade, uh, this band coming through uh, the red box is an end moraine. And we're gonna take a good close look at that. That's a place where the snout of the glacier paused for a while and built up a moraine before it retreated. So uh, a little bit of context, there's the Allegheny River, um, a totally erosional landscape here. Um, here you can see uh, one of these outwash plains uh, and some upland areas. So we're in, in the glaciated area near the boundary of the glaciated area. And there's the location of Sugar Lake. Here you can see the county boundary for reference. So there's the position of Sugar Lake, again, the county boundary. Look at these smooth landscapes on the upland areas versus this really hummocky landscape. This is that end moraine. See how there's the same kind of landscape to the north? That's that medium pink swath on the geologic map that I showed. And again, you know, there are relatively recent streams cutting into it, but this is the hummocky topography. Uh, when you look at this area closely and go visit it, it's kind of easy to get lost because um, the hills and valleys are kind of uh, really irregular. But there's a lot of uh, area here that uh, recent streams haven't cut into yet. So there are lots of natural ponds and uh, bogs in this hummocky terrain as well. Also, uh, the edge of the outwash plain here has some uh, terraces. And there's even a, a terrace in the middle of the outwash plain too. So here's a geologic map with interpretation of the glacial deposits on the left. And you can see this LIDAR image of the landscape on the right uh, with the red box around it. So this is the end moraine, the hummocky uh, landscape that we talked about. Um, but uh, there are um, uh, areas of uh, water sorted uh, glacial sediment uh, here, as I mentioned, in this other pink color, also here on the edge of the outwash plain too. The brown shades here, though, are uh, peat uh, formed from, uh, you know, a wetland uh, and wetlands. Um, so other kinds of deposits. It's not just sand at, near the surface in an outwash plain. There can be fine grain deposits and peats too. Lake deposits, there's Sugar Lake, one of the natural geologic or natural glacial lakes in Northwestern Pennsylvania formed where some glacial deposits kind of narrowed the valley here um, and formed a lake behind it. But if you can imagine the outwash flowing streams and glacial times flowing down this valley, here's a place where uh, there was a narrowing um, and uh, the, the uh, glacial water could have been cutting into bedrock. That's what these blue areas are. There are these steeper little valleys uh, carved by glacial outwash. Um, a really good example of that is in McConnell's Mill, the gorge there, um, a sluiceway cut by uh, glacial meltwater. And a good one of those is around Wilson Mills um, to the east of uh, Sugar Lake. So sluiceways are another feature of the area. Now let's look at uh, the Franklin area. There's a pretty good example from a quarry there into one of the older tills. And we'll see that um, sediments with really different compositions can be very close together. So uh, there can be really uh, large changes in type of soil within these glaciated areas within just a small area. And we'll, here we'll look at another one of these uh, water sorted deposits on a terrace. So here's um, context of the area. There's Franklin. Um, here's the quarry that we'll look at. Um, it's in one of these uh, water washed glacial sediments that is on a terrace. You can see an outwash plain here. Um, some of the smoother upland areas. There's some of the hummocky landscape that we talked about before as well. But here's where we're going to focus next near Franklin. So here are some pictures from the this uh, sand and gravel pit, geologists from the field conference taking pictures of these really great 
laminations. These were formed by uh, water current flowing from left to right. Uh, and the close up here inside the yellow box, you can see these laminations angled down from left to right. This is the, from the front of a little sand dune, underwater sand dune, sand flowing across the top of it and then avalanching down the front of it being deposited. The whole sand dune migrates from left to right. So this structure tells you that the water was flowing from left to right here. There's another one here, another one here, another one here. It's very sandy with some pebbles in it, granules, uh, but not a lot of clay. So a soil formed on this kind of deposit would be a, a well-drained soil as we talked about before. But in the same pit nearby, here's a really poorly sorted, still water washed, but much more poorly sorted. You see there's some layering here. It's not completely absent of layering. Um, there's a boulder in it, uh, all kinds of grain sizes. So not nearly as well sorted as the deposit nearby in the same quarry. Up above this, look at the laminated uh, layers up here. Here's a closer view from around the corner of this. There's my foot for scale. This is a lake deposit of uh, glacial age. So a glacial age lake, and these are thought to be annual layers. Um, uh, during the warm season, when there's a lot of meltwater carrying sediment into the lake, uh, the deposits would have lots of sand and silt in them. But in the cold period, when there's not as much meltwater coming in, uh, the deposits would be mostly clay and thinner. So um, these are annual layers uh, from a glacial aged lake. So there are these huge differences in the composition and nature of the glacial sediment all within a small area. And uh, I hope you can imagine how easy it would be to have a well-drained soil very close to a poorly drained soil in a glacial area like this. Okay, um, another picture from this gravel pit. Remember, this is one of the older tills and this is a sandstone uh, rock uh, that was sitting in the till is broken in half now. And you can see that it looks like it's been infiltrated by groundwater probably in the 140,000 years or longer that it's been sitting in this glacial deposit uh, subject to groundwater, dissolving minerals within it um, and uh, leaving behind these, behind these bands of iron oxide, more and less iron oxide. So it's clearly altered. There's a, a rind developed on this one too, I think uh, from the same kind of thing happening. Here's a crystalline rock. Some of the minerals in this have started to turn to clay because it's been sitting in the ground, subject to groundwater for many thousands of years. Here's a, a rock with uh, maybe some other material that used to be in these um, uh, holes in the rock that's now been dissolved away. So uh, another thing to, to think about is, remember I mentioned younger glaciations pick up the material from older glaciations and carry them along with them. So some of these class may have been carried by multiple glaciations. Now let's look at uh, western part of Crawford County um, and you can see Conneaut there. And we're gonna look at bedrock geology here and also variations in thickness of the glacial sediment that's on top of the bedrock. And remember that the composition of the sand and clay in the till and the soils derived from till depend a lot on what bedrock was being scoured by the glaciers farther north. And we'll also see that glacial sediments thick underneath the valleys here and thinner on the upland areas. Here's the bedrock map. And remember, this is covered by a glacial sediment in much of the area here, but this is the bedrock underneath that glacial sediment. And the colors here indicate different ages of bedrock, Devonian ages in brown. I mentioned before, mostly shale, clay rich, so tills from this area would have a lot of clay in them uh, if they're not water washed and sorted. The other colors here, uh, these blues, yellows, green, uh, those are Mississippian age rocks, the lower part of the Carboniferous. It's a mix of uh, layers of sandstone and shale clay rich, uh, both occur in there. Um, the green though are Pennsylvanian age rocks lots of sandstones there, and there's more of that farther south. So going farther south there, you would expect that the tills here have more and more 
sand in them as the glaciers would have picked up, eroded uh, into bedrock uh, that has more sandstone layers. So you'd expect some changes in the composition of tills from north to south across this area and down into Mercer County. These two are cross sections, west to east, southwest, northeast. And um, you can see these rock layers here, um, uh, different ages of rock. And you see that uh, the rock is, layers are angled down a little bit to the south. And that's why at the same elevation, we have different ages of bedrock um, uh, from south to north across this area. In the next slide, we're gonna really focus in on this part of this cross section. So here, here it is, we've zoomed into uh, the red box here in this cross section, and you can see the line of section here. Now you can see the scale better. Um, these are 100 foot increments. This is miles laterally though. So these cross sections are really highly squeezed. Uh, they don't reflect the actual angle of the land here, obviously. Um, this is Pine Matuning Swamp. There's uh, Conneaut Lake. And those valleys, uh, you see these long valleys, um, there are bedrock valleys underground that are much deeper, hundreds of feet deeper than the current um, uh, valley itself. And much of the uh, bedrock valleys here, uh, much of them have been uh, filled with glacial sediment. They're not completely filled like the old bedrock valley I mentioned that goes near Columbus is completely filled with glacial sediment. They're not completely filled, but they're partially filled. And the nature of sediment here is probably variable. Uh, you can imagine lakes having been formed in these valleys at times, and so clay is deposited in them, but also outwash plains with very sandy deposits too. That buried uh, river valley near Columbus, at one time, people were hopeful that that might be a great source of groundwater, a really good aquifer to get a lot of groundwater out of it. They drilled into it and found that it wasn't just all full of sand that would be great as an aquifer. It had lots of fine grain material and clays and wasn't as good as an aquifer as they had hoped. So now you see the, the nature of these valleys um, underneath the surface of the land too. You can expect there to, to have been a deeper bedrock valley and a thicker layer of, of glacial sediment. There's sediment of glacial age as a thinner veneer on uh, top of these upland areas. Um, and here's some thicker glacial sediment on the edge of the valley. And you might have, you might guess uh, based on what we talked about before that this would be an area to look for some of those water wash deposits from a, a terrace on the side of the valley, uh, like those quarries that we looked at. <clears throat> okay, now we're in the southernmost area. Mercer, Grove City, and Slippery Rock. And um, we're going to look at another bedrock map here. And the main thing I want to point out here, remember there were younger rocks exposed or younger rocks in the bedrock layers near the surface farther south. Well, one of those younger layers down here is of Pennsylvanian age, the Vanport limestone, a marine limestone deposited when salt water came into this area uh, from a, a seaway that was to the west. And uh, there were lots of uh, sea life here, uh, leaving behind calcium carbonate formed this calcium rich uh, marine limestone. It's an economically important rock layer. It's been mined for a long time, both at the surface and underground. It's still mined at the surface. Also on top of it, there's a low grade iron ore that was an important source for iron furnaces that were active in uh, part of this region and uh, nearby areas in the mid 1800s, those stone furnaces that used charcoal as fuel, um, the ironstone on top of the Vanport was an important source of iron. There were other rock layers that were sources of iron too, but this was one of the important ones. Now, some of the former limestone mines here have found new uses. And here's a picture of an example of one of those, um, a, an abandoned mine in the Vanport just uh, east of the map area, east of Slippery Rock and near Boyers, Pennsylvania, is an iron mountain storage facility. Um, there are really important records stored here. Uh, Bill Gates' uh, uh, collection of images 
is stored here. Um, some organizations have um, kind of really secure <laughs> office space here in this former limestone mine. And on the map, uh, the where the Vanport limestone is at the top of the bedrock is shown in this medium brown color. So there are lots of places through here where there are or were uh, quarries of Vanport limestone, um, as well as within the region, uh, some underground mines too. So that's another feature of this area and a pretty neat rock unit. So we've seen lots of the special geologic features here, Mercer and Crawford counties, including uh, valleys with nearly flat floors. We've seen natural lakes, bogs. We've also seen hummocky uplands, as well as uplands with really smooth surfaces and broad rolling hills. We've seen that there are soils developed here, both with good drainage or uh, with really poor drainage. They both occur and they can be close together. And there are lots of rocks uh, in the near surface and surface sediments here that were carried by glaciers down from Canada and that aren't common rock types or aren't rock types found in bedrock here at all. So I hope uh, you've enjoyed the uh, uh, presentation here focusing on Northwestern Pennsylvania. And I'm certainly pleased to have had an opportunity to participate in the Caring for the Woods workshop. And have a good day. Take care.